Okay, welcome. This is a, a very full house, so uh, I thought I'd go ahead and get started because no more people can come in. <laughs> so, um, so my name's Catherine Clark. I'm the chair of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and it's such a pleasure to welcome you to this distinguished lecture series. As you may know, once per quarter, we stop our very exciting and vigorous specialized departmental seminar series and take an opportunity for all of us to come together to celebrate the incredible breadth and depth of science that is practiced in our department. To do this, we invite speakers whose scientific contributions extend across traditional boundaries and address many of the most exciting and challenging problems and opportunities that we face. Our distinguished guest speaker this fall is Professor Thomas Check, who will be introduced by one of our own distinguished professors, Julie Fagan. Thank you, Kathy. So I'll just say a, a few words about Tom. Um, so he um, got both his, uh, his PhD in 1975 and his, uh, with John Hurst at Berkeley, and uh, then did a postdoc with Mary Lou Pardue at MIT um, until, for about two and a half years, until 1978. And for both his uh, PhD work and his postdoc work, uh, first of all, he started life as a chemist. And for his PhD and postdoc work, he was, in, he was actually a DNA guy, which is kind of heresy now. <laughs> but he was a DNA, he was interested in investigating the structure of DNA in uh, chromosomes, DNA sequences. And uh, during that time, he developed a, a Sorlin cross-linking method that actually provided a lot of information about uh, DNA structure. And so then in 1978, so after two and a half years, both he and his wife Carol had um, gotten good uh, faculty jobs, were ready to move on. And so uh, before they did, before they went to Boulder, they took a little vacation. And both of them apparently had fellowships, and the fellowship that hadn't run out yet, and the fellowship committees told them, go ahead, take your vacation, and we'll keep paying you. <laughs> I learned that story this morning. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different time now. But anyway, he went to, <laughs> he went to Boulder, um, where he has actually been ever since, as an, starting as an assistant professor. And I think that his plan was to continue to study DNA. But he wanted to not have to uh, deal with this whole mouse genome uh, that was in the pre-recombinant DNA days, pre-sequencing days. And so he chose as his model system the organism, the ciliated protozoan tetrahymena. They're mophila, or maybe it was actually a different tetrahymena. No, that was it. And uh, <laughs> anyway, it was tetrahymena, and he chose to focus on the uh, RNA, the, the DNA that coded for the ribosomal DNA because it was like in a separate compartment. It wasn't part of the chromosome. And so he could study that individual gene, and he was going to look at how it was transcribed. And then, in the process, uh, strange things happened in his in vitro uh, uh, reconstitution uh, system. And he discovered that there was an intervening sequence, a, a little intron in the ribosomal RNA, where there are almost never any introns, at least in ribosomal. Uh, RNA, and, um, and then realized uh, and proved rigorously that this was spliced out without any protein uh, factors, which led to um, the recognition that, that RNA could be a ribozyme, and eventually he actually even convinced the enzymologists and the chemists that RNA could be an enzyme. So all of this happened, uh, starting in publication starting in two years after he started his assistant professorship. And, uh, and basically by 1982, he had, had, uh, had proven this. And, um, and by 1987, he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And in 1989, when he had not yet turned 42 years old, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, so, uh, this discovery 
of uh, catalytic RNA. It's also led to all these theories about uh, RNA as the origin of life. It really founded a whole new field of science. And Thomas continued to study uh, RNA, self-splicing RNAs in the 80s and 90s. Um, he showed it was an enzyme in 1986, and in 1996 got the first structure of a large RNA, part of the group one intron, um, that was the first large structure, was solved in his lab uh, by Jennifer Doudna, um, uh, which was the largest RNA structure uh, since tRNA 25 years earlier. Uh, so starting at the end of uh, the 80s, so in, uh, through the 90s, Tom turned his, continued to work on, on uh, group one introns, but he also turned his attention to the telomere repeat sequences in tetrahymena and other uh, ciliated protozoa and telomere binding proteins and uh, G quadruplexes. And, in, uh, so, and then uh, that transitioned also into work on telomerase. And his lab in 1990, so he, also, he worked, the lab uh, published a lot of important work on telomerase RNA secondary structure, and in 1997, they identified the, the first definitive identification of the telomerase protein, uh, showing that it was actually a reverse transcriptase. So now we get into the RNP world. Um, and so I told you that Tom uh, was, uh, has been at Boulder for his entire career, but he did uh, physically move for, from 2000 until I think uh, 2009. He physically moved to Maryland as uh, president of the Howard Hughes Institute. And, but he only accepted that position if he could keep his lab running, which he did. And so he uh, kept his lab going in Boulder, although I think he downsized it from 20, 25 people to something less. And he would come back one and a half days a month and just have continuous meetings uh, with his lab members. And I was told by Fang Guo that they actually got more time with Tom this way than <laughs> when he was there <laughs> full time. Um, but uh, while he was at Howard Hughes, he made many improvements uh, to, to the Howard uh, Hughes uh, the way it ran, and one of those improvements was that the nominations became self-nominations. So if you wanted to be a Howard Hughes investigator, well, if you were young enough uh, and had the guts, you could nominate yourself and you might get invited for an interview. So he, uh, and I think he also increased the level of support for science education for um, uh, all the way um, from grammar school on. Um, so then he went back to Boulder full time in 2009, and but before he went back, he you know he needed wanted to continue as a Howard Hughes investigator, and Tom, being Tom, insisted that he go through a formal review process to renew his Howard Hughes investigatorship. <laughs> Needless to say, it was reviewed, renewed rather, and he still uh, has a, is a Howard Hughes. So since returning to Boulder, Tom has continued his work on telomerase as well as uh, he recognized uh, that there's a lot of really interesting long non-coding RNAs out there and very little biochemistry that had been done on them. And uh, so his lab has focused on both uh, telomerase and other uh, RNPs. And um, it's been amazingly productive, both through the time that he was at the Howard Hughes Institute and since he's returned. I calculated that actually the number of papers has only increased, only decreased by half a paper per year while well, you were at Howard Hughes. <laughs> okay, so uh, I just wanna say a few words about Tom as a person and a scientist and mentor. So getting a Nobel Prize at 42 can really be a, a not such a, it can be a big burden. It's a, and, and Tom managed to handle that burden and that responsibility with a kind of grace that has really helped the scientific community. So he took his responsibility to be an ambassador of science seriously, and part of that is reflected in his time at Howard Hughes because he never stopped wanting to do science. He wanted to improve science. And also his current role as director of the BioFrontiers Institute at Howard Hughes. He's also been an amazing mentor to people in his lab as uh, there's a huge list of very famous 
um, and successful former students and postdocs that have gone on to faculty positions and other positions, one of whom I mentioned, Jennifer Doudna. And he's also been a great mentor, not only to his own people, but to other young people he met over the years, like me, who uh, I can think of several occasions where his words really helped me a lot and his actions. Okay, I won't embarrass you by telling them. <laughs> so another thing is he's an amazing, he's, he's a really serious teacher, cares really a lot about teaching, and you will be surprised to hear he still teaches freshman chemistry. Is that true? Or did yeah, you stop well, now? Almost recently. true. <laughs> Almost true. He's, and uh, I asked him about this once, uh, and, he, and I said, Why, you know, what are you doing, Tom? Why are you still teaching freshman chemistry? Why are you teaching at all? And he, and he said he teach, likes to teach freshman chemistry because he can reach the most people. So, uh, and also, I mentioned that he's always stayed at Boulder, so instead of taking the opportunity to go elsewhere, he's taken the opportunity to bring fantastic people into Boulder, one of whom was Aki Ullenbach, and, uh, and, and he's currently recruiting lots of uh, great young people to the Biosciences Institute. Finally, uh, he's also really uh, has, uh, cares about his family time, and he's always uh, demonstrated a good Balance of family, this is what I've been told about you anyway, Tom. Uh, <laughs> and, and so uh, when I suggested his name as our speaker, I warned uh, the department that his schedule is made three years in advance. It's going to be really hard to get him. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, uh, probably we have to make clear that we don't care if he comes this year. He could come the next year. But he accepted right away. And so when I last saw him, I said, Tom, I was so surprised that you accepted right away. He said, well, you know, I have this rule, only one trip a month, but uh, I get an ex uh, dispensation because my daughter is in, uh, living in an L.A. area. And so my wife let me come out for this extra trip. So I want to thank uh, Carol and Jen, who are sitting in the front uh, row, for uh, letting us have this great chance to have Tom here, and I hope uh, we can bring him back again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was such a nice introduction. Thank you very much. And I've had a wonderful time today. I always have a great time. This is maybe my fifth uh, talk at, at UCLA, something like that. Um, it was really a great day, and uh, not only did the faculty have exciting stories to tell, but I had a really good lunch with students and postdocs, and they were very into their uh, research. The faculty will be glad to know that your students uh, uh, imp uh, represented you well during, during, that, during that meal. So what I would like to do today is, um, first, well, first of all, I just need to say that uh, I, too, am in a department of chemistry and biochemistry. In fact, we modeled our original change of name of our department after uh, what had been done previously at UCLA. Uh, and, but now the uh, uh, moved away from the chemists because we're in this new uh, Jenny Smalley Crothers Biotechnology Building, funded by, in part by a gift from Marv Crothers. And uh, in addition to the biochemists being in this building, the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering is in there, and my BioFrontiers Institute, where we bring together uh, physicists, chemists, computer scientists, and engineers to try to solve uh, problems in biology using interdisciplinary uh, approaches. And I wasn't going to talk about RNA catalysis at all. But then last night, Julie reminded me that there would be chemists in the audience. And I, the work that we do more recently is rather unchemical, and you will find that it is, you'll think it's biology. And therefore, so as not to completely bore the chemists in the audience, I added six slides. And you may not think this is chemistry either, but it's more chemical <laughs> than what is going to follow. So for the chemists, if you want to nap, don't nap now, wait till six slides, and then, then, you, can, then you can phase out for, for a bit. So Julie actually set this up beautifully in her introduction, 
to talking about the uh, discovery of this RNA that folded up in a way that it formed the active site for its own RNA splicing reaction, giving something like a trillion-fold increase in rate and very high specificity, which are properties that we are accustomed to uh, thinking about in terms of enzymatic catalysis. Uh, but uh, So I'll take off exactly from where she left off, which is after we uh, figured out, or uh, as we were figuring out that the RNA was catalytic, we also figured out the reaction mechanism. And uh, this, rea this splicing reaction and a yeast tRNA splicing studied by John Abelson uh, in Southern California were the first two RNA splicing mechanisms that were figured out. The uh, tetrahymena, but also I call it here group one introns because it turned out that the, very quickly there were a thousand of these uh, sequenced from diverse biological sources. So these are not in human, but they are widespread in biology. Uh, they all undergo splicing by the same basic mechanism. The intron binds a small molecule, guanosine, and uses its three prime hydroxyl group as a nucleophile to attack the phosphate at the five prime splice site, where the green RNA joins the black. And then in a transesterification reaction, which will be shown in more detail on the next slide, uh, the G becomes covalently uh, joined to the uh, intron RNA by an ester linkage, and then that frees up a hydroxyl group here at the end of the green, and then after a conformational rearrangement, the, essentially a reverse reaction results in ligation of the green and red sequences. This is the part of the RNA that the cell cares about. This is the functional mature RNA molecule and releases the catalytic intron, which in the test tube can go on and act like an enzyme and cut and rearrange other RNA molecules, but in the cell is rather rapidly degraded. It, in the cell, it really only needs to go through these gymnastics once, and then it's, it's done its job. And so uh, there was a period of time when my laboratory attracted a lot of chemists who, would, who were interested in studying transition state stabilization. And of course, it is the stabilization of the transition state relative to the ground state that is uh, the definition of catalysis. And so what we were able to figure out, and, and the, the, uh, this was tedious work, because we quickly found that uh, changing nucleotides was far too gross of a change to really understand catalysis. So we've, we were able to uh, change single atoms, um, such as a, an oxygen atom to a sulfur atom, or changing the hydroxyl group to a fluorine or an amine, to really understand the uh, sort of physical organic chemistry of RNA catalysis. And this required changing one atom in a molecule that has more than 10,000 atoms in it. So uh, through these these approaches, we were able to understand that here at the moment when uh, this phosphate, which would be tetrahedral in the ground state, right? Freshman chemists here, anybody? Tetrahedral phosphate. In the transition state, it's this trigonal bipyramidal structure. This is a bond that is half formed in the transition state. Here's one that's half broken. Here's the nucleophile, the three prime hydroxyl group of guanosine oriented by a number of other interactions. This is a terrible nucleophile because it has a pKa very far removed from neutrality. So the catalytic RNA organizes a magnesium ion right at this position to help activate the nucleophile, another here to neutralize the developing negative charge on this oxyanionic leaving group, and then uh, the reaction proceeds with inversion of stereochemistry around that phosphorus center in an SN2 type reaction. That sounded pretty chemical, didn't it? Okay, so sorry, that's all there's gonna be. But anyway, that was, it, was, it was good while it lasted. And the other thing that the ribozyme does, 
to facilitate this reaction, which is true also of, of other catalytic systems, is it orients the attacking group and all of the participants very precisely, okay? And so when we, when we achieved this picture, that made me very interested in this sort of gray box around the outside because we knew a lot about how protein enzymes bind substrates to catalyze reactions. But RNA seems ill-suited for this task. First of all, it doesn't have the beautiful 20 amino acid side chains, hydrophobic and hydrophilic, acidic, basic, et cetera, that proteins have. It has just A, C, G, and U, which aren't even that different from each other. Right? They're both planar aromatics with hydrogen bonds donors and acceptors, and then it also is polyanion. So it doesn't sort of like want to fold, right? It wants to be expanded because it's got a negative charge at every single monomer unit along the chain. So how do you build an active site for catalysis out of ribonucleic acid? So we turn to X-ray crystallography. Well, we first looked at the secondary structure of the uh, we and others around the world, particularly Francois Michel and Eric Westhoff in France, were very uh, uh, good at, at understanding RNA secondary structure. But this doesn't really, you know, catalysis doesn't occur on, in, in two dimensions. So we really had to move on to the X-ray crystallography level. And um, uh, Julie mentioned Jennifer Doudna's work uh, with a domain of this RNA turned out to be this domain that Jennifer solved actually after she had moved to her own lab at Yale. But then Barb Golden came to the lab and grew crystals of an even larger active uh, group one ribozyme that had the active site in it, 247 nucleotides in, in size, and was able to solve that structure at sort of modest resolution. And it sort of looks like a protein, right? Even though this is made of entirely of ribonucleotides, it's a compact, globular, three-dimensional shape with a concave active site cleft. And then we were able to drive some of these structures to higher resolution. And here in Karajuno's work, uh, we can see the role of a magnesium ion. Remember I talked about the polyanion wanting to expand? Well, here we have a folded part of the ribozyme where the, all of these negative phosphates are being brought close together by this turnaround. Here's the place, this red magnesium ion is what's blowing up here. And we can see how uh, having these phosphates from disparate positions within the chain, 112, 113, 202, 203, very far away, brought into close proximity in the folded uh, three-dimensional structure, and a magnesium ion, in this case, uh, hexahydrated magnesium ion is able to help stabilize that high density of negative charge. And then Fang Guo came to the laboratory and was able to drive the resolution of active group one uh, ribozyme to even higher resolution. And one of the things that I still enjoy showing, Fang, is your uh, uh, work showing what the guanosine binding site looked like. This is the first time in RNA uh, uh, biology that we saw that RNA could bind a small molecule metabolite. Right now, this is sort of commonly known with, with uh, riboswitches, with aptamers. But at the time, uh, when Brenda Bass was trying to uh, defend her PhD thesis, people were giving her a lot of trouble about thinking that RNA could possibly recognize something as small as a guanosine. But here we see how this is done. First of all, there are, uh, uh, there's a base triple between this green base pair and this golden guanosine, which is the one that's going to act as a nucleophile in the splicing reaction. Here that I interaction is um, uh, from, the, from the top. You can see the uh, Watson-Crick hydrogen bonds and then the Hoogstein face hydrogen bonding to the uh, guanosine nucleophile. But this had been predicted by Francois Michel, and was therefore simply being confirmed in the crystal structure. But what makes this GC base pair very special and able to bind guanosine is this base stacking platform. It's the van der Waals interactions between these 
planar base pairs above and below the plane. And so there are base triples. In fact, there's even another one down here. There's a sandwich of base triples here. And for the students, you can sort of think of this as uh, a, a stack of bread slices, right? You take your sliced bread, pull the plastic wrapper off. The, the slices are all lying on top of each other. Now you take one of those slices and you cut a piece out of it, a wedge out of it. And that's where the guanosine, which is that wedge then, is able to crawl into that space and be stabilized by the uh, uh, van der Waals interactions with the slice of bread above it and the slice of bread below it. And so this is a very special nucleic acid structure which allows b the binding of guanosine in a highly specific way while leaving its three prime hydroxyl exposed to attack at the five prime splice site. Okay, enough of the RNA world. We're now going to evolve from pure RNA as a catalyst to ribonucleoprotein catalyst. And there's an important UCLA connection here. Because after we discovered RNA self-splicing, I knew nothing about the fact that there was a whole group of scientists around the world who had been thinking about the origins of life and wondering how could this ever get started if you needed at the same place at the same time a nucleic acid molecule for uh, informational transfer, but nucleic acid was thought to be inert. How would you replicate it? You would need some like protein polymerase. Seems unlikely for all this to happen at the same time. At UCLA, there was a, uh, uh, an evolution club Larry Simpson invited me to this. It was on a Wednesday evening, he reminds me. And I realized during this talk at UCLA that I wasn't speaking the same language as anybody else in the room. I didn't know what, what they were interested in or why they were interested in it. So it was a real wake-up call for me and got me to be reading a lot more about the uh, chemical origin, the ideas about the chemical origins of life on, on this planet. Well. According to this story of how uh, the RNA world might have played out, uh, there, there could at the beginning have been ribozymes providing both catalysis and uh, uh, information transfer. Very early on, there would be random scraps of sh uh, short peptides uh, under sort of Miller-Urey Miller sort of conditions. These are uh, uh, made in actual abundance, quite short ones. Um, or single amino acids, uh, and then if those could bind to the RNA, they might be able to enhance its catalytic activity or give it new specificities. An important moment came when RNA learned how to make the proteins that would actually be uh, helpful to it all the time, which would be some kind of a primitive ribosome, and now we're in the, the modern world where most catalysis is carried out by protein enzymes uh, with perhaps nucleotide coenzymes hearkening back to the importance of uh, RNA in the primordial catalysis. Well, I don't know whether this actually happened. It's a historical question more than a scientific question. It seems plausible. It certainly seems interesting. It may or may not be true. But I do know for a fact that my lab has evolved in this case. <laughs> because we no longer work on the ribozymes. And now we're working on this sort of really biologically and medically important middle ground of how RNA collaborates with proteins to achieve biological function. And the system that I'm talking about today is telomerase, which, as you all know, was uh, discovered by Liz Blackburn and her student Carol Greider when they were at UC Berkeley. And they also discovered the RNA subunit and found that the RNA was able to encode the sequence of nucleotides that were laid down at the ends of our chromosomes, or in this case, with this particular sequence, tetrahymena chromosomes. And after this sequence gets billed out to the end of the template, it slips back and can do several rounds of this uh, repeatedly, and we call this processive extension of the, of the primer. And then it turned out, sadly, that the RNA was not a ribosome, couldn't do this by itself. It needed a protein active site, and Joachim Lingner, 
postdoc in the lab discovered telomerase reverse transcriptase, which was the, uh, related to other reverse transcriptases such as uh, HIV, retroviral, and retrotransposon uh, RTs. And so it's the collaboration between this protein and this uh, RNA that really um, uh, allows telomeric synthesis to take place. And it's been Julie Fagan uh, who has, and, and Hong here at, at UCLA who have really taken this picture and converted it from this egg and ribbon to something that is uh, massively more detailed and, and, and more interesting. But that's her story, not mine. So uh, we're, we're going to um, just briefly say that the RNA subunit of this ciliate um, telomerase is uh, much more compact and simpler than that of the vertebrates such as human and certain yeasts such as the common beer and, and, and uh, bread yeast have, have uh, even much larger RNAs, but that there's a core structure which seems to be maintained in all of these. And then the elaborations that you see in the other species tend to be units that like bring a specific protein, uh, an accessory unit into the complex. So they're, not, they're sort of not directly involved in catalysis, but they're extremely useful for the cell biology of the, of the telomerase. Now, um, I think that because of time, I'm going to skip the next story, which is sort of fun, but just going to go on to uh, why uh, this has been of such interest in the, the, the medical community. So there are, uh, telomerase seems to be maintained on sort of a, a knife edge uh, level of low expression. And the reason for that is probably that, that having either too much or too little of this enzyme in cells can be uh, very deleterious. So on the, on the too little end, uh, there are a number of human diseases, particularly the uh, inherited disease, rather rare, dyskeratosis congenita, but also uh, uh, another, a number of other syndromes that are not always due to telomerase deficiencies, like aplastic anemia, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, that occur uh, even if there's just one good allele of one of the telomerase components and one defective one. In fact, it may be as little as 20% deficit in the level of telomerase is enough when aggregated over a few generations of a pedigree to cause stem cells to no longer be able to proliferate. Because if you can't maintain your telomeres, you can't continue to proliferate, and the cells uh, undergo uh, uh, a conversion into senescence. So why doesn't the cell just make a lot of excess telomerase so it doesn't have to worry about these occasional uh, mutations? Well, probably because too much telomerase is a hallmark or a sort of one foot in the door for cancer. And in fact, reactivation of telomerase occurs in 90% of human cancers because you have to, again, in order to, for a tumor to undergo limitless proliferation, it has to maintain its telomeres. And so there's interest in the uh, medical community of either suppressing telomerase activity in cancer or <coughs> boosting it in the case of these uh, stem cell deficiencies. So because, because of the... Um, I don't have much time today. I'm only going to tell two sort of stories or two, ask two questions about telomerase. First of all, how is it activated in human cancers? And secondly, um, uh, a more of a single molecule biophysics used to um, uh, answer a cell biology, cell biology question, how does telomerase find the telomere? And this has to do with both molecular recognition and the dynamics of the process. So, First, the question of how is it activated in cancer? And this was a complete mystery until 2013, when, uh, because it seemed like TERT should be an oncogene. After all, it's involved in stimulating the growth of most tumors. But 
Only rarely did any group ever find a gene rearrangement or a mutation in the coding region of the gene that might explain its activation. So very different from uh, P53 or RAS, for example. And so then, in 2013, two groups, uh, Levi Garraway's group at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center in Boston and a group at the German Cancer Center in Heidelberg found that everyone had been looking in the wrong place. People were doing exome sequencing on thousands and thousands of tumor samples. The mutation was there, but it was 124 base pairs upstream in the regulatory region. And of course, it makes sense that regulatory regions are uh, just as important as the codons within a gene for specifying biological activity. So uh, these mutations, uh, usually at minus 124, occasionally at minus 146, in the promoter um, make a, a binding site for a um, transcription factor which was uh, later identified by uh, Costello's group at UCSF and by Josh Stern in my lab as being uh, an S family transcription factor, GABP, AB1. So the mutation converts this sequence into this binding site, and that is one contributor, at least, to switching these, this gene from an off state to an on state. And so the prevalence of this mutation is pretty remarkable. 80% of melanoma samples from around the world have exactly that same mutation in the, in the telomerase promoter, and the adjacent tissue, normal tissue, almost never does. And it's not just in melanoma, it's been found in glioblastoma, liposarcomas, it's common in bladder cancer, liver cancer, et cetera, and very absent from some other common cancers such as prostate and breast, probably because they, or per, plausibly at least, because they arose from a stem cell that already had tel some telomerase activity rather than from a somatic cell, and so maybe this wasn't an essential step in tumor progression for those particular cancers. Nonetheless, this mutation is now the, the third most prevalent of all cancer mutations. After P53 and KRAS, the third one is the telomerase promoter. And of non-coding mutations, it is the most prominent of, in, in all of cancer biology. So, uh, Early on, when we got into, when we were following up from the dis people who did the discovery work, we looked at whether, in fact, this promoter mutation really did increase the amount of the messenger, R be uh, messenger RNA being made from this gene. Did it increase the amount of protein? Did it increase the amount of activity? And we found that although there's a wide uh, variation in the amount of either message or protein or activity from cell to cell, that uh, on average there was quite a, uh, uh, an increase uh, corresponding to the mutation and that this was a bad thing if you were a patient with one of these cancers. So here's a retrospective analysis of, um, of disease-specific survival from patients, uh, in this case that with, with bladder cancer, from to an Asian hospital and a New York hospital, and uh, here are the, the patients that have the, the low telomerase expression end up doing much better uh, in terms of their disease-specific survival than those who are the high telomerase expressors for reasons that aren't, that I wouldn't have necessarily predicted. I mean, I might have thought that if, as long as you had a threshold amount of the telomerase, that would be enough to drive tumor growth, but it looks like more is better if you're a tumor. Um, they're, all, they're almost always heterozygous, thank you. Um, and I'll get back to that because it's really interesting in terms of the, the gene expression. Um, occasionally there's, there's, there's a double mutation. So of course all of that is just correlation, it isn't causation, and so 
we've started to turn to CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to um, uh, try to look at causation. And in order to introduce or to erase a point mutation in the TERT promoter, it turned out this is a terrible target for genome editing, less than 1% efficient. And the students got very tired of looking through 100 clones and finding no uh, edited versions. And so they switched to putting in either uh, screenable or selectable markers, in this case, green fluorescent protein gene, put in with the point mutation, then using uh, cell sorting to pull out just the fluorescent cells. And they turn out, they're very rare, but, when, but that pile of cells turns out to have not only GFP, but the point mutation of interest. And then in a second round of genome editing, clip out the, uh, the uh, screenable uh, marker gene, and you can end up with scarless uh, genome editing with now the promoter mutation changed, or if you want to start out with a promoter mutation cell line, you can erase it. And so um, it looks like this, in fact, we had predicted that this would give a uh, doubling of when we take a heterozygous cell line that has only one copy of the um, mutated telomerase promoter, now you make it into a doubly mutated Simple, naive prediction would have been a two-fold increase in activity. Instead, we get about a 60 percent increase. And so uh, at least it is going in the predicted direction. And sibling clones that weren't genome edited do not show that, that increase. So uh, that provides some confidence that this is causal. And then uh, in answer to the question from the front row, and please, any of you, feel free to jump in with a question. I love that. Um, what are the two alleles like? So Josh Stern, when he joined the lab, uh, asked the question, well, um, since only one of the two alleles has the mutation, maybe only it is making the uh, messenger RNA and the other one isn't. So here is a little bit of a Sanger sequencing trace across the TERT promoter, and you can see there's a clean sequence, but except at the position, the minus 124 position, where there's about an equal amount of the C and T nucleotides. Now, if you use an antibody to pull down only DNA that is associated with RNA polymerase 2 in a chromatin immunoprecipitation experiment, you can see uh, a big enrichment for the uh, mutated allele uh, and very little of the wild type allele being pulled down. And conversely, if you do chromatin immunoprecipitation with an antibody against methylated histone 3, uh, lysine 27, which is an epigenetic silencing mark, you see uh, the, the opposite. You see enrichment uh, of the uh, wild type allele. So it looks like within the same cell, these two are being maintained in different states. And then if you ask, well, which one is making RNA, it turns out that um, if you sequence again the DNA, you get, and this is a different cell line, this is a um, bladder cancer cell line, if you, you get both alleles at the DNA level, you really can only see one at the RNA level, and it comes from the mutant promoter. So we have an a unusual case of, of um, monoallelic expression of a non-imprinted human gene. And so the model that we came up with then is uh, that um, uh, in a precancerous cell, uh, both of the TERT genes have been turned off in most of our somatic cells uh, sometime during embryogenesis. They both have marks of inactive chromatin. Neither one is making RNA. And now uh, there's a flip where uh, this mutation in one of the alleles uh, attracts this GABPAB1 transcription factor. The chromatin uh, flips over into uh, an active state, and the uh, polymerase 2 makes RNA from only this allele, while the other one uh, is unchanged from its previous state. And the exact order in which these events occur is something we would love to know, but do not know. 
So, no, in primary tumors as well. Yes, and so we have done. Correct, and 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 also, um, uh, so so uh, people have looked at many primary tumor samples, and a, and interestingly, sometimes in cancers without the promoter mutation, there is also monoallelic expression. And that is very mysterious because we don't know what would make the two alleles different from each other, whether it's stochastic or whether there's a far away mutation that no one's ever been able to find yet. But this has also been confirmed in, in primary tumors. So, um, Josh Stern, uh, more recently in, in unpublished work, has looked at, uh, uh, you, you know, we don't need to go through all this, this data, but the main point here is that um, uh, the, not only is the uh, mark of epigenetically silenced chromatin maintained at the inactive allele, but the uh, enzyme complex, the po polycomb repressive complex 2, and its active, sub, active site subunit, EGF2, which methylates the histones, is also hanging around at that allele, presumably to continue depositing this uh, epigenetic silenced state. And that um, seemed interesting. And then we went on to look at the DNA methylation status and found that that silent allele was also had more CPG methylation. And so this uh, then uh, promoted us to, to actually see if there might be some kind of a feedback mechanism between the DNA marks of silent chromatin and the histone marks at this particular locus. And the other project in the lab involves biochemical analysis of this polycomb repressive complex too. We can purify it in large amounts to uh, mostly homogeneity. It is monodisperse on a size exclusion column. It has a ratio of a absorbance at 260 to absorbance at two, 280, which uh, indicates that it's free of nucleic acid contamination. And then we can use it to, to see how it binds to the telomerase reverse transcriptase promoter. And this work was done by Richard Pauchek, a very talented undergraduate in the lab who um, is going to have, I think, four publications in major journals uh, uh, by the time he's done. He's now at UCLA, which is the region I'm very careful to mention him here. He's in the MD-PhD program uh, that is joint between UCLA and Caltech. And Richard um, uh, paired up with Josh Stern, and they looked at the uh, TERT uh, CG island, uh, and it has these CG, CPGs marked in, in red, and they looked at whether uh, this would bind to the uh, PRC2, as we had found in vivo by CHIP, and in fact it does bind, but if you methylate all of these CPGs, and these are the sites where we know CPG methylation occurs in cancer cells, uh, as measured by sulfite sequencing, then we see a much stronger binding and uh, a change in the equilibrium dissociation constant from uh, micromolar to sort of mid-nanomolar binding. And so it could be that this is a case where the CPG methylation is uh, a repressive DNA mark, in part because it attracts the machinery that makes repressive marks at the level of histone modification something that we're continuing to think about. So then the second and last question is, how does telomerase find the telomere? These are two pretty rare beasts in the cancer cell nucleus. They're the telomere is only about 0.01% of the chromatin in the, in the nucleus. The telomerase is present at only a few hundred copies, even in cancer cells where it's upregulated. So you have two rare things, and they have to encounter each other productively. What kind of a process is um, involved? 
And so before I go into this, I need to just say a little bit about the telomere, which is the chromosome end. I think this is, I looked this up, this is Greek. Telos is end, and mere seems to be sort of like stuff. So this is the stuff at the end of the chromosome. It consists of this repeated DNA sequence, TTA, GGG, repeated about a thousand times on average at the end of each of our chromosomes, and a group of proteins which Tizia DeLange at Rockefeller University has named the shelterin complex, and some of these bind the double-stranded region. But then the, one of the strands of the DNA, the, this strand with this sequence, extends beyond the double helical region for another roughly 200 nucleotides. And that single-stranded tail is what telomerase has to recognize, but also the shelterin complex has a couple of proteins that specifically interact with the tail region. So you can see how this shelter and complex sort of bridges the double helical region with the um, single-stranded binding region. So the protection of telomeres one, which was discovered by Peter Bauman, uh, was then, uh, crystal structure was, was determined by Ming Li in the lab and had these two OB folds with very specific molecular recognition of the sequence TTA, GGG. Each protein binding two of these repeats, and this helped us explain how the protein could stabilize at the end of the chromosome and prevent it from rearranging or being degraded. But it turned out that the more interesting subunit from the point of view of telomerase interaction was its partner, TPP1, and uh, J.K. Nandakumar, when he was a postdoc in the lab with an undergraduate, Caitlin Bell, um, sort of painted the, the two surfaces of this uh, uh, domain of, of the TPP1 protein and then studied whether, which ones would affect telomerase recruitment and found that the single amino acid changes at these orange residues were deleterious to telomerase recruitment in vivo and prevented telomeres from being maintained. One amino acid in this huge complex, and you, the telomerase can't find the end of the chromosome anymore. Pretty remarkable. And these residues shown in cyan and on the, flip, on the other side of the domain had no effect on this process at all. So it seemed to be specific to this tell patch on TPP1 shown here. And then the question was, well, what on telomerase, shown on the right, is talking to the tell patch. So Jan Schmidt, uh, another postdoctoral fellow, and Andrew Dalby, a graduate student in the lab, uh, were able to identify residues on the N-terminal domain of TERT that had a, a, a genetic interaction which seemed very interesting with the tell patch. And so here's the uh, uh, functional or phenotypes of these mutants. If you have wild-type amino acids on both of these proteins, you obviously get functional recruitment of telomerase to telomeres, and you maintain telomeres. As I said a minute ago, if you mutate the um, TPP1 tell patch, in this case from uh, a negative charge to a positive charge, you now get loss of function. Similarly, if you flip the charge of the telomerase amino acid from uh, from a positive charge to a uh, carboxylic acid, you end up with loss of function. But the double mutant, instead of being doubly bad off, is restored in activity, both in vitro and importantly in vivo, and telomeres grow again. So it really looks like these two amino acids are talking to each other. I'm not saying that this whole interface is a positively charged and a negatively charged amino acid. There's probably a complex surface of interaction. But, it's, but this is sort of a keystone part of it that if you flip the charge, that's enough to, to knock it out. And there appears to be a direct interaction uh, that involves electrostatics between these two amino acids. And so with that, and that is important because as you'll see in a minute, this mutant was important for the next set of studies. So what we wanted to do was to look at telomerase moving around the cancer cell nucleus we knew that if we overexpressed 
the telomerase, any of the telomerase components that we would, which is nice and easy to do, you would drive unnatural and unphysiological binding interaction, just like in general chemistry, right? If you mass action, if you have too much of, if you have A plus B going to C and you have too much, you put in more A, it's going to drive it towards C. And we didn't want to see that. So fortunately, CRISPR genome editing came along and we were able to um, put the uh, fluorescent tags in the endogenous locus within the chromosome and found uh, ways of doing the genome editing so that there was no uh, overexpression or underexpression. So we have exactly physiological amounts of expression and we put in a halo tag which covalently binds to uh, an alkyl bromine an alkyl brominated fluorescent dye with bromide being the leaving group and forms a covalent linkage. And this is a very nice dye for single molecule live cell imaging. And then a protein that caps off the ends of the telomeres, the TRF2 protein, was similarly tagged in its endogenous locus with a, a monomeric EOS uh, fluorophore, so that, and then in some experiments, uh, Jens Schmidt also puts in blue fluorescent protein on coilin, which lights up uh, these intranuclear uh, bodies, which are involved in uh, probably telomerase quality control and maturation called Cajal bodies, first seen by Ramoni Cajal 100 years ago. He, of course, didn't have the tools to figure out what they were doing. And then the first question we asked about the tag protein is, well, you put on this tag on telomerase, is it still, does that perturb its activity, right? There's like a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You have to be worried about screwing up the thing you're watching by the thing that you're using to observe it. And um, fortunately, when we express telomerase, and this is an enzymatic assay, for either untagged or flag tagged which is a small protein tag, or halo tag, or halo tag plus the fluorescent dye, all of these are quite active, and there was not much loss of activity um, by putting on the tags. There was a, uh, a statistically significant loss of processivity, the ability to go from making one repeat to two to three to four to five and crawl up the, the ladder, but it was small. It's about a 20%. Uh, decrease. And so we thought, well, that's a pretty small perturbation. But this is all biochemical, so can we show that this, this tag telomerase is active in live cells? And we can. We can um, uh, express either the untagged or this uh, halo tagged version or this K78E negative control mutation that I talked about. And you can see that this guy is not doing well. The telomerase started at the position of the dashed line, and the telomeres are actually now shrinking with time. This is after a five weeks of, of uh, growth. You can see here the quantification. But the, but the halo tag telomerase is not doing as well as the wild type. But again, it is um, certainly allowing telomeres to grow. So we thought that's a relatively small perturbation, and we can go ahead and do the live cell imaging. And so here is the uh, HeLa cell nucleus, and the green dots here are the telomerase, single particles of telomerase. The red dots are chromosome ends. The reason you only see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about 10 of them here is this is just one Z-plane through the nucleus. We're not looking through the entire depth of the HeLa cell nucleus. And then the blue are the Cajal bodies. And so what you'll see is that most of the telomerase is exploring the nucleus by rapid diffusion. Quite rapid, actually. And some of the particles, this is real time, so even in a few seconds, some of the particles traverse a fairly uh, substantial distance of the, of the uh, human nucleus, and we can calculate that each telomere is probed thousands of times 
per S phase. But most of these are, here you can see one that's co-localizing at this particular frame. Here's another one. Most of these interactions are very short, and only rarely is there a several minutes long static interaction, which would be enough for the enzyme to actually build out the end of the chromosome. So those are relatively rare. And so, of course, you can, it's not fair just to look at the pictures and try to interpret them. You have to use software that tracks the individual particles, many thousands of them. You can see that most of the nucleus is explored by telomerase. Uh, the nucleolus is ignored. I don't, I don't know if that's interesting or, or just because there are no telomeres in there, why bother? Um, but it's just an observation. And then uh, for, for quantification of these data, we um, use MATLAB software that allows us to identify telomerase that is coincident with a telomere at the beginning of the movie, coincident with a Cajal body, or in some place in the nucleus that is neither red nor blue, and then ask if we look at successive frames of the movie, is it still there? How quickly does it move on? And as I already said in words, most of these binding interactions are quite fleeting. And after a second, most of them are gone. Or even after a tenth of a second, they're largely gone. But there appears to be um, more st sticking to telomeres and Cajal bodies than there is to random places in the nucleus. Since this is a log scale, this is about a five-fold difference. Well, is this really? binding, or is this some kind of a liquid-liquid phase separation in that part of the nucleus, and they're just sort of stuck there? Aha! K78E. Remember that one? So Gans repeated all of the genome editing, but this time introduced a point mutation in the N-terminal domain of TERT, and now we would expect a perturbation of this binding interaction. And sure enough, the interaction with Cajal bodies, which should not depend on this mutation. Steve Artandi at Stanford has shown that this is due, this Cajal body localization is due to a completely separate part of telomerase. These are unperturbed, but the, inter, the specific interactions with the telomere are completely lost, and now the telomere acts exactly the same as a random place in the nucleus, and there is no uh, uh, preferential interaction leading us to um, interpret these data as meaning that there is an authentic binding interaction shown, shown here. And then the really interesting, uh, or really we think biologically important interactions are the ones, and I'll ha ask you just to look at this particular spot. Occasionally, we see these uh, interactions where the telomerase sticks to a telomere for the entire length of the movie, okay? And so these long static interactions, although relatively rare, uh, are probably the, the biologically important ones. And um, we've therefore developed a model um, that is uh, in which um, uh, telomerase probes the telomere thousands of times per S phase through this protein-protein interaction, but then only rarely is either this interaction converted into this stable interaction that involves both base pairing and protein-protein um, interactions. And in data that I have on the next two slides but I'm not going to show because of the time, we've been able to use an antisense oligo to block this interaction and show that we block these stable interactions but not these probing interactions. So we think that this model has at least some validity. And so in closing, today's conclusions about human telomerase. How is it activated in human cancers? Well, in many cases, uh, there's this minus 124 or minus 148 promoter mutation independently uh, uh, occurring as a somatic mutation in millions of cancers around the world. And it binds this transcription factor, uh, allows maintenance of active chromatin and we get this unusual monoallelic expression while the other allele in the same cell, or in some cases, several other alleles, because cancer cells 
aren't always diploid, um, ends up um, being epigenetically silenced and occupied by PRC2 and um, having increased 5-methyl CPG on the CG island, and these two may in fact causally uh, work together and positively reinforce each other. And little is known at this point about the other half of these cancers that don't have the mutation. Uh, there may be just some kind of, a, of an epigenetic switch there that occurs without a driving mutation because people have looked for mutations within hundreds of kilobases and have found nothing <coughs> consistent that would ex give a genetic reason for these uh, alleles to be uh, different from the other allele in the same cell. And how does telomerase find the telomere? Um, well, it requires two interactions, the tail patch on this shelterin protein at the end of the chromosome, sitting there uh, all the time, has to interact uh, briefly with the 10 domain of TERT, and then to really lock it down, you need base pairing between the template of telomerase and the single-stranded DNA at the telomere, and only when you have both of those interactions at play is there an interaction that lasts for a couple of minutes, which at least in vitro is how long we need to add enough nucleotides to maintain telomere length. And uh, importantly, I need to mention uh, Jens Josh Artzog in the lab uh, who did most of the telomerase work I talked about today, uh, Richard Pauchek, the uh, undergraduate now at UCLA who contributed a lot to the, uh, our epigenetic work, but also in this particular case to the uh, interaction with the telomerase promoter. And, um, and then I have a rule, never pass up a, a captive audience, right? So many of you have undergraduates in your lab. Maybe the graduate students are mentoring undergraduates. So if they're interested in interdisciplinary science, uh, for example, uh, computation and biology and want to learn both of those areas deeply, uh, have them take a look at our uh, interdisciplinary quantitative biology PhD program, which they can find on the internet. And now is a good time of the year for them to consider applying to both our program and other programs. And thank you for your attention.